hope that not, not only basketball fans, but some coaches and GM, GMs will take oh, something yeah, from sure, those conversations. Sure. Yeah, the basketball world, I mean, needs this, you know, because, you know, it's 2023. It's not 1996 no more. You know what I mean? Like, everybody has to grow their mind and, like, open their, like, views and different, you know, look like see see the whole world and stop being like so like tunnel my tunnel vision you know what i mean on everything so yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah exactly they need to hear the different perspectives so and i think that before especially coaches they were not so open minded but now they have to adjust they have to adapt because the need of let's say flexible coaching flexible personal manage, uh, management especially in a season with like playing every two, three days, there's not that much coaching left, you know? So I feel yeah, most other definitely. things are coming into I mean, play. And in general, like, you know, this new generation is different. I mean, I'm sure you can, you know, attest to this. I mean, like, when I first came to Partizan, like, it was my first time, like, being, like, one of the older players on the team. And, like, I'm playing with people born in 2003, 2004. You know what I'm saying? So, like, they grow up with a phone and Instagram their whole life. Like, they grow up watching, like, media platforms like this, like, seeing different, like, the way they view the world is completely different than, like, somebody born in, like, the 90s or, like, the 80s or whatever. So, like, coaching them is different as well. You know what I'm saying? You can't coach them the same way, like, because, like I said, it's 2023. You got to be able to, like, open your mind a little bit to be able to work with the players because at the end of the day, like, we all trying to work together to win, you know, and that's a common goal. You know what I mean? And if you have people on two different dialects, someone still coaching like they in the eighties and you got a 2004 born player, like he not going to respond, you know, the right way, even though he got all the talent and all the skill, because like everybody says, you know, the skill level is out of this world. You got people seven foot five doing things that a point guard does. And, you know, it's, it's a whole different, life and the skill level of basketball so you want to be able to get the most out of that talent you know what i mean and you have to be able to coach and tap in with them in the right ways you know say things that are like stick with them so they'll be able to use it on the court you know mm -hmm. yeah probably eric can tell us something about coaching uh nowadays teach uh, teenagers right yeah yeah <laughs> what do you like what do you like or what do you, do you dislike about nowadays teenagers it's delicate um, you got to talk to them nice. You got to always compliment them before you criticize them. If you criticize them too much, you're a hater. Um, if you're too hard on them, <laughs> you don't like them. So it's like, it's a fine line. It's a fine balance. So I just learned that be very complimentary first. Tell them everything they did good first. If you have to search, examine, find that, then they're more receptive to listen to the criticism or the critiques that they need to work on. But you can't overwhelm them. It's just got to be a couple things. So pick the ones that the most glaring or the ones that stand out the most. But then you'd be okay. Like, no, it's just diff sure. it's different. They This is a participation uh, community where they, where kids, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets an award. Everybody gets notoriety. Like in our era, like especially mine, when I grew up, it was winners and everybody else was losers. And that's just what it was. <laughs> like, that's how I right. raised my kid. You either win or you lose, and it's okay. Like you bounce back. You um you learn from it. It'll help you grow. Everybody loses at a point in life, but these kids don't know how to lose. That's why as soon as they get adversity, a lot of them fold. Your kid gotta learn how to lose. Your mom and dad can't bail you out of every situation. Sometimes you gotta let people fall on their ass. Yeah, and most definitely, like I would say, in today's era, right? It's kind of different because you don't really have, like, a surprise guy come out of nowhere no more, you know? Like, yeah. it used to be, like, somebody could fall through the cracks, and you'd be like, damn, where did he come from? Like, and like, and then they uh, NBA draft pick or something like that. But nowadays, it's people with their phones out recording kids when they 10, yeah. you know, like, 11. So they can't even really be kids no more like that. They grow up. You think about somebody like, uh, Wam Wamayama, I always had problems saying his name, but uh, <laughs> he had a phone in his face when he was like 10. You know, they got videos of him. I remember when he came to Lithuania, I think he was 16 and he was like seven foot. And like he's grown up literally with a phone in his face in t his entire life. So like to see that, you know what I mean? Like he's not really had the 
the grace of like really like becoming his own, like without like people like noticing him like that. He's always been in the limelight. You know what I mean? So it's just a different era, you know, growing up in today's age. Mm -hmm. So in general, but hey, it's again, people probably going to make, he'll probably make a billion dollars in contracts. So it's a different era growing up, but hey, the rewards is different too. For so sure. When you look at that. So. <laughs> Okay, everyone, welcome to our bonus show. I'm the host, Donatos Rubonas, and I'm joined by two intelligent uh, gentlemen from the United States, uh, Zachary Vincent Lide and Eric <laughs> Lane McCollum II. Nice to have you here. Good to be here. You're going with the government today. <laughs> Full government. Yeah, I respect it. I respect it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great to have you on the show. We will discuss a lot of different topics uh, from nowadays European basketball uh, as well. But we'll start from from partisan stuff. And I remember that we tried to set this podcast uh, somewhere in the middle of July or in the beginning of the July, but Zach didn't have his uh, new contract signed. He was still in negotiations. So he was like, okay, let me sign somewhere and then let's talk. I don't know if you said something like you're superstitious, but you you just want to make it clear, you know. So finally, we have Zach uh, with an extension in, in Partizan. We have you on the show. And can you get us through your free agency? Because I believe it has to be a little bit unique because, first of all, it felt like the whole market was freezed up because of Sasha Vizenkov, Vasily Misic waiting for the NBA offers and the NBA free agency. Then there was this Nikola Mirotic thing wh where everyone thought that, okay, until he signs somewhere, then, you know, others will start moving. It turned out that he probably was the last to sign, but, you know, the whole market was already uh, moving a lot. So how did you feel in this uh, free agency? Because at the same time, I believe that frontline players, especially players who can play four and five positions, they get got some nice paychecks uh, this summer compared to the previous summers, right? Cha -ching, cha -ching. <laughs> nah, I mean, I mean, in general, <laughs> I mean, there was a specific, there was a specific need, you know, for uh, people trying to fill their rosters. And, you know, you got to respect that. I mean, you got some of the best coaches in your world um, contacting you and, um, and um, calling your phone. So it was good, you know, um, in general, free agency was pretty much a whirlwind. You know, uh, the specific needs that I that I bring to the table can check a lot of boxes for a lot of teams. So um, my name came up in a lot of uh, talks and and a lot of negotiations and different things like that. So the main thing was to uh, be in the best place that was for me and the best place that well I wanted to win and to move forward in the next couple of years. I mean. I mean, I don't, you guys know uh, the type of guy that I am. I don't like talking about myself a whole lot, but the things that I do on the floor, they don't really show up in the stat sheet like that. You know, it's a lot of deflections, a lot of like diving, charges, stuff like that. So like for me, like the specific place that I go to, I just want to be, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm there and that um, the option that, can go in and just be my normal self every day, you know, and show up and just because I'm an everyday guy, I just come, I just show up, I just do my job. I don't need a lot of like nooks and crannies and this and that and roll out the this and that. I mean, that's, that's good and all, but you know, I'm just an everyday guy I just show up and do my job. So the main thing was really just that and just figuring out what the best fit was at. And when I discussed with coach, And um, when I discussed with the other people and I came down to talk to my family and the people that are in my corner, it was best to uh, extend. And um, we got some things ironed out and it was good. So, yeah, I, I have like at least three things that I'm I, I'm intrigued, uh, intrigued to hear from you. Uh, first of all, I don't want to go too much into details like conditions of the contract, but Am I right to say that you didn't accept the richest offer and you took less money to stay in Partizan, which could be the part of the priorities that you set uh, in this free agency? As you said, you know, looking for uh, the best situation where you could, you know, uh, show all, all all of your capabilities. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, <laughs> the the parts of the contract that are ironed out, they're specific for me, and so. Uh, 
and it's and it's good to uh as we go forward as far as uh going down the line and um achieving all the goals that we want i want to say that well um, i mean to, you accepted less money compared to the what other teams could have brought on the table because at least that's what i've been told by some let's say sources and people yeah that's what i'm saying i mean i want i want i want i want necessarily say that but uh i mean in general though like uh the way we structured everything it's uh the best going forward is uh for everybody to uh win and to be able to go forward and to be able to move ahead and feel good about themselves you know so but i wanted to say that i i accepted less money though <laughs> so, partisan knew what they had they knew they had somebody who was worth getting paid they did right by you and they're gonna try to run it back you know i respect it you know they have newfound funds and i'm glad that they were able to reward you and kevin and some other guys yeah most definitely i mean Dude. we have a good core so i mean i mean as far as me and kp i mean it's crazy that we ended up you know we met in milan and we gonna end up being teammates for almost i mean i guess five years now so i mean it's kind of crazy i mean we never would have drove through thought it would have ended up being like that but hey I mean, it's good, and we continue to build and go forward, you know, so. Yeah, and you're building a culture and, and partisan. You're, you're creating a legacy together with Coach Obradovic, so that's a it's, that's a great reward, and that's a huge responsibility. And the other spicy thing I wanted to hear from you, is that true that you had an offer from Red Star? Uh, <laughs> I won't really go into that, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I won't really go into that, you know. I, 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 I mean, it was definitely I definitely had an interest in free agency, though, in general, okay. you know. So I won't really I won't really dive into that. But I definitely had an interest in free agency, and I had a lot of different uh, interests from a lot of different places. So it was interesting. It was fun, and at the end of the day, I'm blessed and grateful that i was able to go through this because i mean the story that i have and the path that i have is not an ideal one so to get to this point in my life and to be able to earn my way to this point is definitely a blessing because there's a lot of hard work and focus and attempt determination behind that so and ju just the last thing i wanted to hear from you uh i think that you re-signed with partisan like few days after uh, Partizan found an ext extension agreement with Kevin Punter. And I thought, was it important to your decision? Uh, was it also related to the fact that he has stayed and that you put, you know, Partizan above uh, some other teams? Because if that's true, maybe it's kind of, you know, a new trend of, you know, building cores around some players or that's what's more let's say usual usual for the nba probably where you can see some some guys some new cores building up uh, those big teams no nah, mo i mean most definitely i mean um when k extended it was a, it was big news um i mean i knew what was going on behind the scenes k is one of my my best friends uh that i've had since i've been a professional so i knew what was going on behind the scenes and when he extended it was big news it definitely uh, played a part in my negotiation. Like, okay, I still got K here. Um, when I was looking at all my options on the table, looking at pros, cons, and situations and different things like that, it was like, okay, I still got K here. You know, um, we built this culture here, right? Because, I mean, when we came to Partizan, I mean, it was brand new. You know, it wasn't like a popular thing to do. I mean, it just kind of just came left field. So, we just came and we built this culture from day one. I mean, we were, I mean, the year before we were like the youngest team in Europe, you know, trying to uh, help young players learn and help them understand their value and what they bring to the team uh, while also getting the best out of ourselves while we in the prime of our lives and our, in our career and stuff like that. And so when we came here, we started building the culture from day one and then, you know, guys come along, you know, Matias came in, um, Dante, James, you know, and we start, we just kept building this culture. And so, uh, when that news came out, it was good to see that he got paid and that, uh, he got the bread that he deserved, that he earned, that he showed and proved. 
And um, that was definitely on the table when I was looking at the options of extending and pros and cons and different things like that. But like I said, we built the culture here from day one. So it's part of it was like part of me was like, do I want to keep that culture, keep pushing that culture forward, you know, and keep uh, being a part of a, a organization and keep on building, you know, you know, American players, I mean, he can attest to this. You don't really get that often, you know, as an American player or as a foreign player in general to come in um, and day one, you know, when a club is at its lowest to come in and then to build that step by step up and up, you know, and you got young players that are coming on the biggest stage and they trying to show and they trying to prove themselves too. And so that's just a blessing to be a part of, especially at this point in my career, you know, usually like we're the guys coming in, like, replacing someone or feeling the need but to come in from day one to build that part of and be part of a club and be part of the uh resurgence of a club is definitely a blessing so it definitely played a part in my uh excited deciding to uh extend so yeah it, it feels like partisan was building around your, you and uh, Kevin Punter, you as a core of the this partisan team. And it feels like they're missing like at least a couple guys, one point guard and one center. And that's where I want to hear Eric's opinion on how partisan should complete their roster. Uh, starting from the point guard position, uh, there are very important rumors. Of course, Zach knows better than us, but we're not going to try to, you know, uh, to get him to expose all those candidates that might join Partizan. But uh, I saw Euro Hoops uh, report that Partizan is in, in negotiations with Nick Kalatis. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not sure at what stage of this free agency it happened. And I'm not sure how serious or advanced it was. But I heard that they also, let's say, at least checked Mike James' status. And at this point, we have two very different point guards, right? Mike James and Nick Kalatis. What do you think, Eric, what do you think, what kind of point guard, what the profile of the point guard would suit this team best watching their uh, roster and the core? So I think the biggest thing is they need someone who can organize, um, get him in offense. I feel like you want Kevin to be a scorer. You want him to feel comfortable on the court. You want him to be attacking in closeout situations, um, getting the ball in pick and roll situations when he's coming off of staggers and screens where he's dangerous to shoot. You want him constantly moving because if he has to create everything, he's easier to guard. The defense is set, easier to send double teams, easier to track. So if you get a good lead guard who can kind of dictate the flow in the offense, it relieves Kevin's energy. He doesn't have to do um, so much offensively as far as setting the table, creating for others. Um, if you go with Kalathis, I do like Kalathis. I think he does things defensively really well. He can organize them. He can pass. He can get everybody involved. You're going to be relying heavily on Kevin and Zach to score because Kalathis is not a scorer. He's a guy who's going to create excellent. Even at 34 years old, he can see all the passes. He can play pick and roll. And you're going to need Zach and Kevin to pick up the offense a little because he's not really a half-court scorer, but he's really good in transition, finding things. He has a sneaky floater. There's certain mismatches they can exploit with post-ups. If you go get a guy like Mike, um, now you have a big three. Um, it allows those younger guys who are adjusting – to go out there and just play defense and to take what's given to them. They'll get wide open shots um, and everybody can kind of fit into the role. But I do like the Kalathis folk just because I've seen how um, Abravich works with point guards. You know, you've seen Kalathis, he's an American slash Greek guy, you know, more American, but you know, you know, that's what we'll just say. But um, we've seen uh, Abravich work well with Greek point guards, you know, with Seleucus. We've seen him work well with American point guards. So I know, you know, with a veteran, you want somebody who's experienced, who can be coached difficult. Like, he played for Saras. He played for Tudis. You know he can handle difficult coaching. He can handle being challenged. It wouldn't be an issue for him. And that's why I like to collate this fit um, for them. And it allows Zach and um, KP to continue to grow because everyone knows at this point they are the pieces. They are the central focal point of the team. Uh, if you get a guy like Mike, it kind of like, there's a dynamic shift. And what I see in a lot of guys is players want other players to fit in and they don't play their game. And my rule is be who you are. Anytime I play with guys on my team, I tell them, be you. Don't worry about me. I'm going to find it. I'm going to figure it out. I want you to be who you are. And so the thing is, I just worry if Zach, 
and Kevin maybe take a little bit off the gas. And I don't want that. I want the foot on the gas. I want them to be you. And whoever they bring, they're talented enough to adjust and adapt because you've already shown that you're a team that's capable of getting to the Final Four. So for me, I, I do like to collate this fit. I'm not sure that they need a Mike James type of point guard. I, I love Mike. I think he's one of the best players in Europe. But I think maybe more of a especially the way Kevin and Zach were scoring them in the playoffs, showing that they can handle the load. I think they need someone who's going to just run the offense and make the game easier for everyone else first before scoring. And by, by the way, before we continue, please, Serbian people, just not freak out about Mike James' name, okay? We, we don't need, need him in posters <laughs> with partisan jersey. We don't, we don't need any big headlines that partisan is going to sign Mike James. It was just a probably, you know, it, par, it was a part of work to check Mike's status. That's it. That's what teams do. That's what scouts do. That's what GMs do. So relax, relax. And we're just talking about the profiles, player profiles. At this point, man, uh, we gonna sign Brownie James. I mean, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, most definitely, I mean, we gonna miss Dante a lot. You know uh, what he was able to bring at that position. I mean, he was just a Swiss Army knife. You know, like, I mean, he wasn't the traditional point guard, but what he did was, I mean, he tilted. I mean, we. I have a saying. I mean, my, my college coach has a saying. He made everything go downhill for us as far as pushing the pace um getting the ball out fast i mean and that's what we want to do is we want to play a up tempo style and um play really fast so i mean once he got his rhythm i mean it was tough to stop him you know he was probably the best downhill guard in europe so we'll miss him a lot but i'm glad that he was able to um uh, get what he wanted and get back to the league um as far as john controlling the tempo he grew a lot you know as far as vocally um, defensively, you know, uh, learning when and picking when to pick and choose moments to be aggressive defensively. You know, uh, he really took big, big steps of growth. And even in the ABA finals, you know, he took that step of real growth. You know, we would have these conversations in the locker room like, Yam, it's going to be on you to – take that step of growth that we gonna get to where we want to be and he was able to take that load on and um put everybody in their spots and organize and learn okay it's my time to go it's my time to organize i need to get this good play right now um okay we on a 10-0 run how do i manage this how do i do this how do i use my energy in the right ways um as far as nick i mean we all know what nick can bring to the table you know uh when he's put together with a mastermind of a coach. Um, I mean, he checks a lot of bo boxes as far as size, defensive ability, and obviously passing. You know, it wouldn't be as downhill as Dante with the ball in his hand, you know, but Nick is downhill in a different type of way. 94 feet getting a rebound, making a pass, you know, and it's in your hand, bread basket, and you're just putting it in the basket and reading tags and reading the low man reading the help side and making good plays out of that so um i mean he's a special player um and as far as that you know i mean in general it's kind of crazy our the past two years our point guard position has been so different you know when you look at all the people that have been in that position so it's definitely going to be interesting to see who we bring in and um uh, how they'll be able to adjust to the culture that we built and the style that coach wants to bring to the floor, which is hard nose, fast, up-tempo basketball on both ends of the floor, you know, so. Spe speaking of centers, uh, I mean, is it just like replacing Matias Lazort with another energy freak, hustle, uh, roller, rebounder, or different type of center could be also beneficial uh, for partisan i think if it, um the results have worked you've seen how the team fits with that type of profile the problem is it's very difficult to find a five man with the motor and with energy um, it's simple for a five just to rebound play defense sprint the floor play hard it sounds simple but a lot of fives don't have the physical shape the conditioning the mental toughness to sprint the floor every time, to go for every rebound, to make every effort and energy play. And that's what makes Lasort so valuable. Um, and probably 
not easily replaced. Um, I think that just looking at the market, there's not a lot of bigs that can do what he do. Um, there's guys who are athletic. There's guys who have motors at times. But to me, he's the hardest playing big in the year lead on both ends. Um, yes, he has some deficiencies in his game. Of course, every player does. But the way he attacks the offensive glass, the way he was able to always stay healthy, the way he was able to play 35 minutes a night, battle with the trees, going in there, fighting, finishing, dunking, the way he uh, brought the energy with the crowd, allowed them to stay engaged in game. Sometimes when there was a lull, when things weren't going right, what he did would not be replaced. But what you can do is you can find a, a cheaper version. They're probably going to have to go to the G League to find somebody who's young, who's athletic, who's hungry, who has that motor. I think it's going to be difficult to rep replicate that because Lasort plays like a guy who's in a low level who's trying to get to the high level. What I mean by that is his energy, his effort, his hunger, his drive, not by his talent. His talent is high level. His skill is there. But he played like he broke. And and he need and he hungry. He played like he don't know where his next meal is gonna come from. And I, I just don't feel like you can get that type of energy from a guy who's making millions of dollars. Like that's just the type of player he is. That's his character. You can just tell. Like I'm gonna go get it every day he plays. It's like I have something to prove. And I do believe Partizan can be a great team. They can still have success, but they're not gonna find that. Like that just doesn't exist in this market. Let alone if you look at all the roster, who plays as hard as Lasort. I can think of nobody. So you got to go find someone who's hungry, who's eager to prove himself. And you're probably going to have to get two two bigs. Um, Zach can play some five. I like that. I like them to use him more at the five. You know, take it back to his Olympiaco days, put him in some pick and pop situations. I would like to see that. But I think um, if they don't use Zach as a lot as a five, then they need to go get one five who's hyperactive. Um, and I was just scanning the markets and I'm trying to think, but like most of the fives, you know, off the market quick. I would have loved a Devin Booker. He's athletic. He can run. He came off a year where he was injured. He's going to be eager to prove himself to show some. I think he would have been a great fit. I like a Josh Nebo. Mm -hmm. um, I like Alex Poitras. Like, but those guys don't have the um, the motor that Lasor has. But they're like the closest ones that I could think of. And you know, from seeing that, Eric, I I, ha I have one name. Yeah. I I, I have one suggestion. Who you got? Uh, what? Okay, now he's under the contract. But I know that, especially when this whole Nikola Mirotic thing was happening, it was close to happening. What do you think about Freddy Gillespie as a replacement for Matthias Lazor? He is. Also coming from the G League, yeah. having the EuroLeague rookie experience in Bayern Munich, and then taking the next step in Partizan. I like his fit. Super athletic. He had that first mulligan year. You know, a lot of guys who come from the G League or the NBA, they have that year where they kind of have to get their feet wet you saw it with Dante in Barcelona you saw it with Carson Edwards this year in Finner um, I mm -hmm. think he got that year out the way now he's adapted, adapted to the style the off the court living and what I like most is that you can get him at a reasonable cost because you know Zach and KP took all the money so you get him for the low <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and he'll come in hungry and bring in the effort so I think that's I like what you did there Donatus that's a, that's a good pickup <laughs> Nah, I mean in general, I mean yo, you funny as hell. But in general, uh, in general, uh, you know, Matias, I mean, you know, a situation like that is, you know, you can't even write a story better than that. You know, a guy with that type of hunger is kind of gifted to you. You know, in a sense, when you think about how he came from Maccabi, you know, um, how he got to Maccabi in the first place and then how he came from Maccabi to us and um, the way the way he came in and he seen I would say like the way he came in and he assessed the situation like and the culture of like what we were all trying to build together as a group and the way he infused himself into that and became a part of that you know was something special I mean because I mean like I said he kind of came out of thin air, you know, and then he came and showed up and seen, like, what we were trying to build and what this thing had the potential to be, you know, and, I mean, um, like you said, he, he's very talented. I mean, he's always had the talent. I mean, he showed that on the Euro Cup level and dominating that level, but the way he worked on his body and came back in that second year of Partizan is something that is has to be, you know, 
I mean, he rewarded himself. You know, he really invested in himself, invested in his body. He came back with a different body, different mind, different attitude, and it showed, you know, and um, he got the rewards from that. And I'm glad to see him get the rewards from that, you know, because, I mean, somebody, I mean, that's the thing that I love about Europe is that, you know, if you put that work in, you know, if you really – come out and you show people like, all right, like this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to show people. Then you're going to get rewarded, you know? So uh, he really put that work in. Um, and like you said, playing a lot of minutes, I think me and him together probably played top five minutes in Europe overall, not even just EuroLeague, in Europe overall. Many of the moments, many of days we were just in the ice tub together discussing like what we gonna do how we gonna make it from game to game and what our plan of attack would be you know going into games and so uh i'm glad to see that he got rewarded and things like that but as far as like replacing a motor like him i don't think you're gonna do that you know as far as like replacing a motor like him like you said he he played like he was broke and he, I mean, we had these conversations in the locker room. You know you have conversations in the locker room. You coming in and, you know, guys is looking at guys and, you know, he's like, I want this guy. Like, he he, st- he stepped up to that challenge. Every game he's seen a guy that he had been seeing, you know, and he had that list and he was headhunting in a sense, you know, and he wanted to earn that deal and wanted to be uh, reciprocated in that way. And I'm glad to see my brother get paid and um, move on to his next chapter. You know, but as far as replacing him, you're not going to replace somebody with a motor like that. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and I mean, us together, with both our motors together, it was, you know, intense. So, I mean, you just appreciate guys for what they bring to the table, uh, their pros and cons, what they bring to the table. And, I mean, coach been coaching for 30 years. I mean, he, I mean, what people say is the epitome of coaching, you know, so he'll be able to find somebody to come in and do his system the right way and to be able to uh, push the system, push what we have going forward as far as what we're trying to build as a club going forward. I mean, when you look at the different types of centers that he's had, you know, the center position is important in his system. You know, when you look at somebody catching the ball on the pick and roll and making good decisions, you know, I mean, like I just said, the center is very, very important in all the systems that he's had. When you go to his Fenerbahce days yeah. with Vesely, when you look at us Udo. past Batiste. two years with Partizan, Panthenikos, you know, like the center position is always very, very – yeah, Batiste, exactly. The, the center position is always very, very important, you know. And so I think coaches looking at looking at – guys and testing to uh, their strengths and what they bring to the table both on both ends. And I think that he'll be able to make the right decision, whether that's two guys, whether that's one guy. I mean, but like I said, you would have never even drawn up the story of Matias coming out of left field the way he did, you know, and being able to assess the situation and the culture that we were building and to be able to infuse himself into that. And oh, I have the guy to for become y'all. a part of that. I have the guy. It just hit me. So obviously, the sort earned his money. Um, I thought he was animal at Malaga, uh, Monaco. Now, I didn't know why teams mm-hmm. were low on him, but they they soon mm-hmm. learned. Jalen Reynolds yeah. played in Russia. Motor, energy, finishes, tough, physical. And um, I'm not sure if he's available or not, but I know he was in Russia last year with Onyx Kazan. They won a yeah. championship. I think he would be an ideal replacement if I was um, part of them. I like him. But by the way, the funny story is that uh, Matias joined Maccabi like two seasons ago as an injury replacement for Reynolds, I think, for like two months or something. I think it was Zizic. And then Reynolds came back. Yeah, yeah it was Zizic, Reynolds, and then Lazard joined them on a short-term contract. Mm-hmm. And as soon as Reynolds came back, Lazard was not getting a, a lot of play, uh, minutes which he needs actually, you know, to feel the game, to, to feel efficient and to be sure. efficient. He was, he, he made the cut and, you know, he left and he joined Partizan. And then that's another example of how quickly you can turn things around and became one of the most, you know, uh, attractive center options in the EuroLeague market. So 
yeah, kudos to Matias for making this huge leap in basically a year and a half or, or just one season. Mm -hmm. Most definitely, most definitely. is well earned. I mean, he worked. Like I said, I mean, there was plenty of days we were both in the cold tub. We was on the training tape. We was on the uh, therapy table. We was doing whatever he had to do, you know, because like I said, like I'm an everyday guy. So it was part of what he wanted to do was to become an everyday guy and become that consistent guy that the club would lean on. And um, as far as health and availability and different things like that, you know, and that's one of the main things as far as increasing your value. And so he was able to do that as far as changing his body and his mind and everything. And I'm glad that he was able to get what he deserved. So. Yeah, it's, it's funny that Eric brought Mike Batiste's point because to some extent, Zach really reminds me a lot of, of Mike Batiste. And when this whole Nikola Mirotic thing was happening, and it was, he was really, I mean, even Zoran Savage confirmed it, that they had an agreement in place and some force majeure things has happened that he switched to Milan. But did you try to, you know, think of ways how you will play more as a center next to Nikola uh, Mirotic? Did you try to model the game of, of Partizan for the following season in a different role, maybe? I mean, I, I mean, for me, one thing about me is like, I'm a, I'm a guy that I really just don't believe in the sum unless it really happens, right? Like, I mean, even when I can, I can uh, say, for instance, like when Capazzo was coming to rest, I didn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I really did not believe he was going to come, you know, and then he came. So, like, for me, when all these rumors and different things are going on and stuff like that, like, First of all, I don't really see him like that. All my friends, they keep up with European basketball now and stuff like that. So they send me things like, what do you think? What do you think? This going to happen. Oh, you're going to be with this guy. Oh, you're going to play with this guy, blah, blah. And so for me, like, I just taken the test of just being able to make my game to be able to play with anybody. Like, I don't, like, I'm not selfish in the way where I'm like, oh, like, well, I want this and where I want that. Obviously, like, every player has his ego or, in, in, like, even the most unselfish people, like, have, like, where they get on the court and, like, there's certain things that they do, you know, and they, like, okay, like, this is how I'm going to get going. This is how I'm going to start having a good game or whatever. But in general, though, I mean, I just kind of just wait and just let things play out, you know. And, um I mean, of course, it would have been in very, very interesting to have me and him on the floor together. You know, when you think about the floor spacing and the playmaking that could happen from both positions, you know, at the four and the five position, or even if you put one of us at the three and we just switch everything, you know, and you just, I mean, you have a lot of people that can play a lot of different positions and that's the way basketball has gone in today. I mean, that's what the most successful teams are able to do is have a positionless five on the floor, you know, guys that can cover a lot of, uh, check a lot of boxes and a lot of different positions. And so it definitely would have been very interesting to uh, suit up with him and different things like that. But, hey, hats off to him. I mean, he going to Milan, so uh, good luck to him. And um, in general, though, like, we'll, we'll see what, who we bring in and what we're about to do, you know. But it definitely would have been interesting having him on the floor and being on the floor together. And um, what we've been able to do together, it would definitely have been interesting. But like I said, I don't really believe in rumors and this and that. Everybody's reporting something different every day. So it's kind of hard to even keep track. And it's not like Woj is reporting it, you know, in the NBA. When Woj says something, the whole world stopped. It's like, oh, my God, like, this is about to happen, like, for real, you know. In an instance, Europe is different in the fact that, like, everybody's just kind of just going off of just the whim and their sources and different things like that. And also to speak on that, this is, like, the first year, like, I mean, I'm going to my seventh year in Europe. This is the first year I've been hearing – I mean, obviously there's rumors and different things that go along every year, but to hear the different rumors that were coming out and this guy's doing this and, whoa, oh, uh, it's already done for next year and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, bro, we in March and y'all talking about this is done and or we in December and this guy did this and blah, blah. It's, it's crazy, you know, and that's why I really, I really don't pay attention to it and I don't believe things until they happen. But I mean, all the best to everybody and 
I just hope everybody stay healthy and to compete. It's going to be a very interesting season. So, yeah. I have to take this blame as a media uh, representative on this podcast, you know. There were too many premature reports and stuff and I I just think that it's it's because of people feeling rush and chasing to be the number one guy who reported something, yeah. you know, instead of chasing the truth, the facts and sometimes being more patient about the information mm -hmm. they're getting because in many cases they're kind of right because something starts happening or it's close to heading to some direction. But sometimes you just need to be patient to wait for some things to happen. Kevin Punter and Barcelona example, uh, one of these examples, Toko Schengeli and Pantnaikos example, the Virtus not letting him go, and uh, many more uh, situations where, let's say, there should have been more responsibility and patience in, in, in these reports. But yeah, every year I think it will be difficult and difficult to control these things because new reporters are emerging on on twitter and it's it's just getting out of control it's yeah. just getting wild so, and some of, so yeah. just get and, used to it and some of it's not the reporter's fault there's times as a player where i honestly thought i was going to a different team i'm like yeah i'm going to be playing here mm. like i might have been younger and i'm like yeah i'm gonna yeah people would ask me at home i'm like yeah i'm probably gonna go here and then you know you're in negotiations with two or two or three teams and the other two teams you know, aren't reaching your financial needs. And you're like, all right, you don't want to reach our financial needs. And, you know, I like all these situations. This is where I'm going. And then all of a sudden, they find some type of money out of out of nowhere. And then you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> now it gets interesting. And then you're like, all right, well, maybe I'm going to go here. And so I think a lot of it isn't the reporting's fault. It's we as players, we change our minds a lot um, because teams give us – uh a viewpoint of this is all we can do. This is all we mm -hmm. have. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is my decision. You know, obviously there's multiple factors that go into it outside of just financial, but financial is a big factor. You're leaving your country, you're leaving your family, you're leaving your comfort zone. So financial is important. If you have kids, you know, where it's going to be at, the weather, is there schooling? There's all different type of choices that go. A lot of European fans think it's just money. No, that's a big fa factor of it. It is just like everyone works for money. You know, so it always kills me when they say, oh, you play for the money. You think we work this hard to play for free? <laughs> like, you think I wake up this early to play for free? Like, of course not. <laughs> If it wasn't about the money, I would just relax a little bit. It's a little bit about the money, but mostly it's about mm -hmm. I'm happy when I'm on the court. I feel good. So we do mm -hmm. change our minds and it happens. Even for me, instance, last season in the summer, I really thought I was going to go to Venice. I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to Venice, you know. Talked to the coach, was a good guy, and I felt like the situation was good. And then Ufa called me, and Ufa was like, um, told me what I needed to hear, told me what I wanted. I already liked Turkey. I was already familiar with it. I love Turkey. And my mind was switched like that. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they came with the terms, and everything was there. So that's just the example of, yes, reporters do pull the trigger, but the market is unpredictable. But and yeah, in general, that's what I mean like, about – In, in yeah. general, like, I mean – With all these situations, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm just glad to see, uh, I mean, players just taking the empowerment of their situation, you know. I mean, with a lot of things going on, you know, guys can kind of feel like, I'm not sure, I mean, like certain guys from certain countries and certain backgrounds, I feel like they can kind of feel entrapped and like having to do a thing, like certain things and like have them to have their negotiations in a certain way. So I'm just glad to see guys – Hey, man, if that's what you want, like, take empowerment in your situation, you know, and just try to get the best deal for yourself and your family to be able to go out and perform and to play basketball oh, the best way you can. Because, it's happening in this cause, market. Cause I, I didn't see people make exactly. choices that I couldn't believe. Like, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> hey, and at the end of the day, like, it's, it's that player. And, hey, if that's what you want in your specific terms and your, and your uh, negotiations, then a hey, more power to you everybody don't want to sleep take at advantage night. of your situation everybody so, don't want exactly. to sleep at night everybody is you know daredevils it seems you know some people like peace hey. i'm a peace guy you know i want to be comfortable but i want to be at peace exactly too old too exactly. old to be to be living this this crazy lifestyle <laughs> too old hey, to be traveling exactly, with security <laughs> hey hey everybody in different stages of their careers you know and at some point like I mean, you know, like how it is, like when you get to certain stages of your career, you're just like, hey, man, 
I'm trying to just come in and I'm trying to handle my business. I don't know what y'all talking about. Is this bread here? Is this there? Is the coach there? Is there stability? Yep. You know, and hey, cool. I'm ready. Yep. You know, so because at the end of the day, we leaving, I mean, as foreign players, you know, we leaving our home for 10, 10 and a half months. I mean, we were gone 10 and a half months this year, you know, so I mean, to go out and to put our mind, body and soul on the line to win the titles and to achieve what we want to achieve as players and to help the clubs get to feats that they haven't been before, you know. So at the end of the day, like, hey, take that power as a, a player and empower yourself and make the right decision for yourself, you know. <laughs> Yes, speaking of reporting, speaking of uh, social media and Twitter, did you see Monaco social media post with Kemba Walker, Walker breaking Nikola Mirotic's angle, uh, ankles Ooh. from their NBA days? Me. Of course you saw it. I mean, mean right over 2 million left. people saw that tweet. Ooh, he didn't hit so many people with that move. I mean, you at this yeah. point, you, you just kind of chalk it up. Like, you know, you're a great player, but defense isn't really your your forte, you know, you're solid, but offense is what makes uh, Miritich special. And, you know, it can happen to any big fella. You know, you're seven foot, you're chasing somebody quick and shifty. Like, it happens. But um, I thought it was funny. You know, as a player myself, yeah. I would laugh. Like, if you were good enough to cross me up and knock me on the ground, like, I'm going to come down. I'm going to try to get you back. I'm going to play hard defense. But, like, afterward, I would laugh. Like, dang, I really got embarrassed a little bit. You know, but it's just part of the game. Like, everyone is so talented and so good. There's days when... Miritich is going to embarrass someone else or he's going to do something or he's going to drop 40 on you. Like, it happens. But, you yeah, know, that, that was a nice right-to-left crossover. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's that cardiac Kimba. I mean, he's been doing that a long time. That's a long, long time, you know. And that NBA court spacing, you on that island, that's a whole different spacing, you know. So, I mean, uh, I mean, congrats to him. I mean, that was a hell of a play. But, I mean, like I said, he's been doing that a long, long time. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. But what what do you feel about Monaco posting it with the caption? Is this your star signing, Milan? When they announced Nikola Mirotic signing, how hey do you man. feel if you're a basketball fan? How do you feel if you're Mirotic? And how do you feel if you're? Oh, Kemba we beating them. If I'm Mirotic, we beating them, and I'm giving them thirty. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> thirty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure somebody like Mirotic. I'm sure he not even. He don't even see nothing like that. He just. He somewhere playing with his kids on a boat or something like that. He don't even see nothing like that. You know what I mean? But, I mean, it's always nice to be a little, you know, a little petty LaBelle going in there, you know, put a little pettiness, <laughs> you know, put a little salt in whatever they're trying to do, you know, as make a the PR game more staff entertaining. in Monaco. So, make, it, it most definitely, it'll be funny. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I know for sure that some people – Uh, made it a huge problem. I mean, Monaco being disrespectful to Mirotic and to Milan. But I think I, I didn't look that way. For me, it was very entertaining. And as you guys said, I mean, that's now for Mirotic and for Milan to step up, to to get a 30-point game, to get a win for Milan, and then to post something, to quote that tweet and to text something. And that that's what I, exa uh, what I especially expected from Milan because the usual or the best marketing wise response would have been okay guys that's cool that's a cool tweet and just a quick reminder we're hosting you on november 2 and that's the link for milan fans to buy tickets for uh, some pre-sale or something i really think that it would have worked well uh, from marketing perspective you know to bring some fans to watch that game because what's good i think that it's actually i hope i really hope that mirotic didn't take it uh, as some kind of disrespect and from what i actually heard Milan, after all that fuss that happened, they reached out to Mirotic just to confirm that, hey, we're just making fun on Twitter. It's nothing personal. It's We have nothing against you because, I mean, they were after Mirotic. Mirotic. They wanted to sign him. So they, it wasn't a sign of disrespect. It was just a unique way to use unique footage of Kemba Walker, new signing, getting you on skates in the NBA in front of Michael Jordan and, you know, on using this you know time uh, timing uh, for this tweet so you know i think that they're cool uh they're cool with each other and there were no bad feelings uh, after that but again i think that euroleague wins because i don't think that somebody really cared about milan and monaco matchup before the season but now a lot of fans will mark november 2 to watch mm -hmm. how mirotic will respond to monaco and 
I wouldn't say Kemba Walker because he didn't do nothing, anything. But Casualty of war. That, that brings some excitement. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. But you have fun with it. You gotta, you gotta be able to laugh at yourself. It's all part of the game. And anything to grow the brand, I think, is excellent. So I'm okay with nah, it. Nah, for sure. Anything to grow the European basketball grand, brand, I think, is uh, super dope, uh, super good. Um, and in general, I mean, you know, on that island, on this floor that we on, on this high level, you know, it's days you get got. It's the main thing is that you don't get got a lot. Happens you know? to the so, best of us. Hey, hey. So the main thing is you stepping up to that challenge. You keep stepping up to that challenge, you know. So it's not a part. It's not a lot of positioning to where, I mean, he'll get put on that island a lot, a lot of switches like that. But in the NBA, it's different. It's a whole different ball game. You know, guys is hunting guys. You know, guys like Kemba Walker with a handle like that. So, I mean, it'll be definitely interesting to see how that will translate and what he'll be able to do on the European, um, on the highest level in Europe. So, But to be honest, when I thought about this situation, the only victim, let's say victim, that I could see was actually Kemba Walker. It, is it, I mean, if, if you try to put yourself in Kemba's shoes, doesn't it look like the club actually putting Kemba under bus because now Mirotic will try to go after him, you know. Now Milan, all the fans will try to go after him, although he didn't do anything, you know. It was not him posting that uh, video after uh, Milan's uh, announcement. So if you are a player, let's say er there was a great highlight of you, Eric, you know, breaking somebody's ankles, or you, Zach, putting somebody in poster, and this whole you know, thing was put in that way, don't you feel a little bit bad? Or it's like, okay, now I also have to mark this game to, you know, to stand my ground uh, that night. For me, I would laugh. I would think, um, yeah. you know, first Kimba from New York, so I know he's with all the smoke, um, just how he plays, how he <laughs> attacks. And then um, for me, it'd just be, he doesn't play my position, so I know he's not going to come at me all hard and stuff. But it also will be a lesson, a reminder, like when you get a switch on me, you better foul. Or, or you better call for help. Like So I would just come play my normal game um, and just do what I do. But I know if it was somebody who played the same position as me, they would be motivated to like to bring it. And I like to catch guys more relaxed sleeping. So I don't like to poke the bear. You know, everybody's really talented. I don't want to make good players angry. Like I want you to come. I know everybody's going to play their best in their hardest game um, normally. But if you give a really good player extra motivation, you know, you, you could pay for it later on. I think um, <laughs> I think uh, they got a nice probably 25 piece coming their way with a little barbecue sauce on the side. Miritage is going to do. But I, I believe if Kim is in shape and he's healthy, you know, he's going to hold his own. Yeah, I think I think uh, in general, I mean, I don't think that they like marking games or nothing like that. I mean, for somebody like him, I mean, you know, he's been in so many different high level situations and his earnings and different things like that. He's not even thinking about it like that. I feel like, I mean, he's been on that stage a lot. I mean, obviously this will be the first time he's on it in the European stage, but somebody like him, he just coming in and I mean, that's what he do. You know, he has a handle. I mean, he head hunting guys. So that's why I said, it'll be interesting to see how he translates to the uh, highest European level because the spacing is different and, the defenses are different and there's people at the elbow stunning and different things like that. In the NBA, you know, when you get on that island, that's a whole, that's a lonely place. You know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, like I said, even the best get got, you know, so the main thing is to not get got a lot. As far as Miritich, I mean, he just going to come in and just do what he do, you know, as far as like consistency and production. I mean, and in that system at Milan, I'm sure that coach will tweak it to where he'll get a lot of touches and, different things like that. So it'll be definitely interesting. So, Yeah, guys, on a more serious note, Ricky Rubio has decided to stop his professional activity to ca take care of his mental health, uh, which means that he won't play in the FIBA World Cup 2023, which is a huge blow for Spanish national team because they won't have Lorenzo Brown as well. And it also puts his NBA career in jeopardy. Uh, he still had two-year contract with the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, the, the the worth of the contract was around 13 million uh, euros. He's 32. Uh, and how do you feel about reading news about guys like Rubio? Because he's not the first and he's not the last one who has some, let's say, 
mental health things to address, which sometimes requires even things like stopping uh, your career. Have you ever been at such cross crossroads in your life? Have have you ever had teammates in this position who kind of looked like lost and you know faced mental health issues? And do you recognize players in that situation? And what would be the best support for such players? It's a very wide topic, but I thought that it would be cool to to address the issue. Yeah, it's tough. I think anytime you're away from family and friends and people who love you, that's the first thing that makes your mind wonder. Um, you know, Rubio being all the way in America. You know, you don't feel the same when you step foot up. Anyone who's left home, you know, it's a little bit different. Now, granted, you can find people who love you, you know, wherever you go and you might meet new friends, but it's still something feels like it's missing. And then if you have children, um, you never know what people are going through. Divorces, separations, death in the family. Um, all these things are like a knife turning and making a bigger and bigger wound. Um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what, you know, occurred in his life, you know, what brought that upon him, but I know there are a lot of people who deal with it and everyone thinks just because you're successful or you have money that you're immune to this or because you're a really good basketball player or a good actor or a good singer. You know, everyone's human. Everyone deals with, you know, traumas and emotion differently and process it differently. And I think it's big that you can speak on it and talk about it, whether it's with, you know, someone you're close to, um, a family member, a friend, um, a wife, a husband or whether it's um, a professional. I think it's important to be able to express yourself, um, to get that emotion out, to get the feeling out, and to be around people who maybe can relate or who can be compassionate um, because they can tell you, you know, maybe they went through this or they went through that. But a lot of people are closed off. They don't want to open themselves up to that, to that vulnerability and also to judgment. You know, with social media um, also can be so cruel, um, especially I believe that he's really balanced something because that's a lot of money on the table and to walk away from that shows me that you know you're prioritizing your health i um, mean your well-being over the money which is you know, kudos to him that's extremely important and it can allow him to get back on track and hopefully the Cavs, you know do right by him and you know put him in a good situation i don't know like what they're going to do financially like how that's going to work but you know i hope they can be there at least for him you know getting the proper help every step of the way. He's been in the lead a long time. So I know he has that proper insurance. If things you go over 10 years, you have insurance for life, um, you and your family. So, you know, he should be in a good position there and, you know, using those resources, you know, contact NBA PA, um, you know, all the things that he may need, but it's, it's tough. Um, and, you know, it can happen to anybody. Um, you just need to be cognizant of that. And, you know, I hope people can be sensitive and, um, respect his privacy and when he's ready to open up and you know talk about it you know just be there for him it's, that's the biggest thing that people can do yeah I mean to speak on I mean I don't want to speculate or whatever speaking on another place situation but in general um, you know you like uh, he just said you don't never know what he's going through I mean somebody like Ricky Rubio I mean he's been in the limelight since I mean, you want to talk about, we were talking about earlier, people having a phone in their face, people watching. People, I've been hearing Ricky Rubio's name since I was like in middle school. You know what I'm saying? I'm a grown ass man now. I'm 29, you know? So I've been hearing his name since I was like 14, 13. And so to, uh, for him to be in that spotlight for so long, um, dealing with what he's dealing with, you know, uh, kind of carrying that, uh, Spain Torch on his back, being one of them great Spanish players, coming to the NBA, uh, performing at a high level for a long time, um, through contracts, making good money for a long time, you know, and it's crazy to think that he's still, I mean, pretty young for the most part. So, like I said, I mean, he's been in that spotlight for a long time, and so you don't never know what he's going through. I mean, if there's a death in the family or something, you know, I mean, I know he had a big injury a couple of years ago. That's also part of that as well. And so to have like a couple of big things happen back to back to back like that, that could take a toll on someone. So, you know, I just look to give kudos to him to try to find the help that he needs um, on the journey that he's on, you know, because I know that, I mean, to leave – you know, and to go across the world to play in a place it's not easy, even if it's the highest level in the world and it's the NBA and the glitz and the glamour. You know, it's not easy to just get on and to just always be 
you know, 12 to 15 hours away from home and, you know, playing. And, you know, the games can kind of just blend together if you're not in the right mind space and a head space to go out there and to do what we fell in love with as kids, you know. So kudos to him to be able to uh, take that step away and to get the help that he really needs to become, to get back to where he's feeling like his, you know, good self and to where he wants to be in his life as far as growing as a man off the floor, you know. Yeah. What what's important to mention that his mom passed away last year and they were super close. Mm. And you mentioned another good point. He's still only thirty two years old, although it feels like we're hearing about him all his life because yeah. he has played in two thousand and eight Olympics when he was seventeen. He yeah. became the youngest player ever to play in the Spanish league at the age of fourteen. And he made his yearly debut uh, a few days after turning sixteen. So he always had this early chip on his shoulder as one of the you know biggest talents ever coming from Europe, and he had to carry those expectations through his NBA career, you know, to prove his name, to prove his worth, mm -hmm. and that's where I think that uh, the longevity and the consistency of being on the top all the time is such an underrated thing because I mean that's that's why I have a ton of respect for guys like LeBron. Uh, and it feels like we take his longevity and consistency playing at the top level for granted because, you know, he's LeBron. He's We're kind of used to see him dominating all the time. Although this whole path, this whole route is so physically and, you know, talent-wise and mentally demanding to be on the top all the time, to mute that noise, to meet some, let's say, demands of the highest level is such a big thing. And to be consistent at that, it's it's for me, it's, you know, Ton of, ton, of, ton of respect for those guys who, who managed to to play all those years on the top level. And, you know, that that's this thing of being famous or being in this path like Ricky Ruby or LeBron James, it really kind of hit my mind because now, for instance, I have a son who is 19 months old and he loves basketball. He's playing. I didn't force him at all. He just loves hooping. He just loves loves dunking this mini basket. Mm -hmm. He loves watching basketball. He claps watching highlights on, on Twitter. And uh, whenever he sees like picture on basketnews.com where there's a player just holding the basketball, he just suddenly comes to, to watch what's going on. So, and for me, it's kind of, you know, lovely. It's nice. It's cool. But at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling like if he falls in love with the game at such an early stage, is he going to burn out at some point if he continues continues to follow the game, to play the game? Because I hear all those stories about new generational talents getting into the game just at the age of 10, 14, not like those, you know, uh, hoopers coming from six years old or something. And it feels like that they, they have more in their tanks, you know, to deal with the game, to deal with the discipline of the game, with all that fame as well. So, you know, this Ricky Rubio thing, him being like getting this Luka Doncic treatment for, for, from his early uh, days, both in Spain, both in the NBA, kind of, you know, hit me a little bit about when there's too much love for the game on where you hit the fame and the, this basketball path too early. I'm not sure if it's the main reason of what he has to deal with right now, but just looking at his path, you know, just uh, got me thinking about a lot of things. Most definitely. I mean, and like he said earlier, you know, that support system, having that support system as a player, you know, to be able to break through, to untap potential in your game, to go to the highest level, you know, and like you said, he lost his mom, you know, you know, that's probably a big part of his support system, you know, since he was 17 playing the Olympics in 2008. And for him to go to the NBA and to, oh, I got Westbrook the next night and, oh, I got Halliburton or one of the other superstars coming up, you know, like to lay some up against the best every night. You got pit bulls coming at you every night and to lose a big part of your support system. I mean, as a player going into the highest level, you know, the games can kind of blend together, but to have that support system as a wife, you know, your parent, you know, someone who's kind of pushing you in your corner when you have a bad one, whenever you're putting together five or six good ones, you know, you know, it's good and bad days in this journey. And so to not have that big support system can be tough, you know, as a player. So, I mean, kudos to 
kudos to him. I hope he gets the help that he needs and that he continues to grow and be prosperous as a person on and off the floor. So. Yeah, I have a, another question inspired by active Twitter profile, active basketball enthusiast from Twitter, uh, which is w uh, worth a follow, Lupaya, if I pronounce it right, or Marco Pagli uh, Pagliariccio. He counted all the major yearly departures and NBA arrivals. So from the NBA, we have Willie Hernan Gomez, Kemba Walker, Juancho, Juancho Hernan Gomez, Raul Neto, Frank Jackson, and maybe, maybe Kendrick Nunn or Svi Mihaljevic uh, also will, will come to Europe. And from departures, we have Zach's friend Dante Exum and also MVP Sasha Vizenkov, back-to-back -back Final Fours MVP Vasily Misic and Filip Petrushev. So the question and the topic that Marco brought did Yearly got weaker? Did Yearly got stronger? I think. How do you look at I, those moves? I think it's gotten stronger. Um, more talent was added than it was lost. Now, granted, those three players you mentioned were extremely talented, but we're bringing in players at a greater depth. All those names you mentioned, all those guys who have European experience, who also have NBA experience. I think when you start to see these guys who've had prolific NBA careers and guys who have made a lot of money continuing to play the game over here, it shows the respect and the brand of European basketball that's growing. So just that alone, getting the caliber of a, a Willie Hermangonas, getting the caliber of a Kimba Walker, those type of guys were probably players Europe would miss out on a lot and they would come to Europe when they were way past their prime, when they were older, broken down. Like you're getting guys who are still in their prime age, still ready to move and still play at an extremely high level of basketball. So to me, the product's growing, the game is growing, and European basketball respect is growing throughout the United States and globally. Most definitely. I definitely can agree to that. I mean, I started my career in 2017, and when I even, like, signed to Europe, it was, a, it was still, like, an uncertainty. Like, I didn't know what I was getting into. You know what I mean? Like, but now, like, with you guys' platform, with um, the EuroLeague platform trying to grow their brand, I know they were trying to get on ESPN um, in this past Final Four. I mean, if they're able to do something like that in America, that would be huge, you know, for them, uh, for American people to be able to watch European basketball at the highest level, you know, to be able to just flip that on, that would be major because all the games are so important. And like he said, the game is growing. Um, the EuroLeague is growing. And it's not so much of a question mark really anymore with social media and different uh, out media outlets kind of showing, like, what the game brings and, like, the lifestyle on and off the floor. You know, guys aren't really as, like, in the dark, you know, as coming over here, like, as far as making that decision to come from the NBA – to come to Europe, you know, I'm someone I've never played in the NBA before, but, you know, like speaking to guys and speaking to Dante and guys that have played in the NBA for some of their career to come to Europe, you know, a lot of that has gone into it, like looking up the place, like looking up how the team is, looking up how the leagues are, like they know they still, okay, like people still see me. I'm not forgotten over here. You know, I'm not just over here just playing – Mean if meaningless basketball. No, like I'm playing the same like basketball that's trying to be at the same level as the NBA or work toward to get into that level as far as exposure and uh, being on that top level and being respected on that top level. So I think that is super dope to see um, guys with uh, that NBA pedigree coming over here and prolonging their careers and showing that – they still the highest at the highest level of the world to get back to the NBA or to chase something different in their career, you know? Yeah, it's, it's good to see so many NBA names uh, coming to Europe. But at the same time, I still remain to be, uh, I prefer to be patient for to, to see what we will get. Because, I mean, Vazenkov, Mitic, even Exum uh, becoming one of the best, let's say, guards in the EuroLeague, they were the marquee players, you know. Vazenkov, MVP, unique game, unique skill set, unique things he brought to the EuroLeague. Misic, back-to-back -back Final Four MVP, and his clutchness, it was something special. Filip Petrushev was also, you know, uh, 
growing growing player. He also started to build his name in Europe. And from the other side, okay, I have no doubts about Vili Hernan Gomez. I mean, I think that he will be a perfect fit, but regarding some other guys, they still have to prove something. Like Kemba Walker, can he stay healthy? Juancho Hernan Gomez, how he will adapt, how he will try to be in a, let's say, dominant figure in Europe as an off-ball player. Raul Neto, I hear a lot of good things. Some say that he might be even better than Facundo Campasso, but I mean, it's gonna be his first year in Europe after so many years in the NBA. Can he? Does he have that pedigree uh, in his game? Frank Jackson, I hear a lot of good things about his scoring abilities, but what about the off of the court stuff? Can he adjust to the European basketball? Can he adjust, adjust to European way? I mean, still some question marks to solve to see if we are getting, you know something bigger from the NBA uh, compared to what we have lost uh, from the top of the EuroLeague? Yeah, I think in general, like, when you speak of names, right, like, I mean, I feel like, you know, to compare Neto to Composo, that's kind of tough. You know, Composo is a proven winner at the highest level in EuroLeague, you know, um, respected veteran EuroLeague player. And, um, I mean, the European game is just different, you know. As far as adjusting, um, Neto hasn't been over here in a minute, you know, and they would just depend on who the coach is and how he would use the specific player to get the most out of their talent. Someone like Frank Jackson is super talented, you know, super talented scoring and creating the game. Um, it would just depend on the coach and what the coach has in store for them and the type of role that they have to be able to work together. Because like I said earlier, like we all trying to, accomplish a goal together, which is win, and I want to play good as a player. So at the end of the day, like, I'm not signing here to come here and, like, not be successful in the role that you have for me. You know, I want to be the best. I want to get the most out of my role and what I can do to provide for the team and for the club. And it would just depend on people, both both sides working together, you know, to be able to get the most out of the talents that they have. Yeah, I think – um the talent that's coming in is greater, just unproven. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. if you just look at the careers, yeah. you look at the Good size, point. the physical attributes, their games, um, it's it's more talent coming in. There's no question. It's just that those other three guys were proven, and it took them time to solidify their role. There was a time when Sasha was uncomfortable in the Barcelona roster, looking a shell of himself. There was a time when Mises was in Zagiris, and he was a defensive player, and no one knew what FS would do with him as a main guard was he Larkin's backup like people progress and grow over time and I just think that with talent um, you can do anything if you go in open minded and if you have the right work ethic now that's remains to be seen if they have the right work ethic if they have the character but strictly looking at talent and ability um, it's greater for the incoming players than the departures for sure even when you look at uh, the NBA like those guys going to the NBA, what is their role? You know, what does the coach have for them in their role? You know, I mean, I hope all the best for them and they getting their bread and stuff like that. But I hope that they can have success because it's good for European basketball to continue to grow and to show those guys, to show like what those guys can bring and the value that they can bring to the NBA as proven high level EuroLeague veterans, you know, because at the end of the day, the NBA is so young. So, that's why you have guys coming over here with the talent and the skill level. And you'd be like, dang, I feel like that guy played seven years in the NBA. He's 24. You know what I mean? Or he's 20. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, damn, like, he's coming to Europe. It's his first job. He's still adjusting to the culture, the country, wherever he's at. He's adjusting to the basketball, uh, whatever the coach role for him, you know, dealing with personalities, you know, all that matters when it comes to playing at these high levels because at the end of the day, you lacing them up and you got a guy that's trying to chew your face off, whether it's in EuroLeague level or the NBA level. So, you know, you just got to respect where you at and just be where your feet are. So, uh, We have BN Plus platform, uh, which includes subscribers of basketnews.com where they get some extra features, including asking our podcast guests some questions. Uh, you can actually join our BN Plus platform on basketnews.com slash plus. So one question is coming from uh, from BN Plus member Mark, and he wants to hear of all the transfers this summer, is there anybody that you're very happy for 
whether that is because you knew them personally or because of a particularly good fit or amount of money they've had landed? Um, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for all my teammates, you know, uh, that were on this past team that we had. I mean, we had a lot of hardships I mean, we had a lot of ups and downs. It was not easy, you know, coming together as a young group in the highest level. So I'm happy for all my teammates and all the decisions that they made, you know, whether it was to stay with us or whether it was to depart and go somewhere else. I just know at the end of the day, we really had to earn where we were, you know, as far as just a group. I mean, when we look at where we were at in December, you know, to be able to go through those growing pains and then end up on that other side, raising that trophy. I'm just happy for all my teammates this past season that I was with at Partizan because it was not easy. We was coming in the locker room. We was really discussing, trying to figure out how we could get the best out of everybody in the minutes that they were getting. You know, and so everybody was putting in really, really hard work every day. So I'm just grateful and just happy that I could get that experience with them and that everybody can just eat and progress in whatever they choose to decide for their career, you know. Eric, about, what about you? For me? You, I mean, we all know that you were always happy about guys being paid well but maybe you have some individuals that you're happy the most about. Yeah, I'm a different type of vet. I'm a vet that want to see all these young guys get big money. You know, I want to see the money continue to grow and the league continue to grow. I want to see it in a better position and better shape than when I left it. Um, so that's my goal. But for me, I was very happy for Darius Thompson. Um, anytime you see a good person, you know, family man, you know, ex-teammate of mine, you know, continue to ascend. You know, we were roommates on the road, just hearing our stories, talking, me trying to help prepare him for a light ahead, him being unsure and from on the court, from financial talks to retirement to preserving your wealth, trying to do certain things and just seeing him finally attain his goals and get to that level that I knew he was capable of. I was extremely excited for him um, and him. And even though we'll be, you know, opponents now in Ephesus, you know, dinner on him when I pull up, but, uh, I, I definitely am happy for him and, you know, anybody else who's just a good person and, you know, continues to do things for their family and the community and you know, make an impact. You know, those type of people I want to see continually to have success. Sure, for sure. I mean, his growth was super dope. I remember when we were in Milan, when me and KP were in Milan, he was at Brindisi. And so to see him, like, you know, go from Brindisi to have, like, in these past two years, this – super growth is in the game. It's, it's cool. It's cool to see. That's why I say in Europe, like, you go out on that court, you do what you got to do. I mean, people see that, you know, and you get rewarded for that. And that's one of the good things that I like about Europe, you know. So I'm glad that he was able to do that because I always knew that he was a good player when he was at Brindisi. I mean, they beat us when we were at Milan. I think that was like our only loss in the Italian league before the uh, playoffs. So I was definitely – Happy for him to see him get what he deserves and earn it. So, uh, on more on more negative notes, uh, what were your feelings? What were your reactions? What do you think in general about this whole situation with Yuri Gareffs and alleged bribery uh, attempt? Uh, former Yuri referee Ambrosov claims that, I mean, there was some bribery attempt involved with Boris Rizik, one of the top EuroLeague referees, and also Greek referee Ilias Koromilas. And they said that uh, he was offered like 10,000 euros to make some calls in favor of Kazan in 2021 Euro Cup final against Monaco. Uh, what were your feelings? What are your thoughts? And was there this moment? I knew it. I knew it. something is going on. I knew it's something bad is going on in the EuroLeague or European basketball in general. I mean, you can see it anywhere. Um, the NBA had issues with it in the past. Um, Tim Donahue, you can look up the stories, a Netflix special on it. Um, I'm not surprised. Um, anytime there's high stakes, there's gambling involved, there's, you know, passion, there's going to be people who will cross the lines ethically. I do think a lot of the refs, you know, don't take part in that. But some refs, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, based on how the games are called, based on the level of communication with you. Some don't allow you to speak to them. Some have, um, you know, 
big, big egos. But then there are some who are excellent, who talk to you, who allow you to understand what you did wrong, what you could do better, and who are humble. So there's a balance. But, you know, if you put a group of people together, you're always going to find a, a rat and batch and everything. You know, it's just like um, you could get a, a beautiful basket of fruit. You know, over time, you know, one or two pieces are going to rot. And the key is just to get those out, pick them out, throw them away. You know, if you can do that, you can limit some of the corruption and some of the issues at hand. But some things are unavoidable. This is life. And, you know, you can't hold people's hands throughout the entire process of everything. It's impossible for the Euro leader, the NBA, or I mean, even if you look at um, in, uh, police officers, you know, any type of thing, it's impossible to have everyone be 100% good. So I'm not surprised. Um, and this is Europe, you know, so there's a reason why sometimes there's the same champion and some domestic leads over and over and over again. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by saying that? <laughs> <laughs> if it's, you'll never see in, in America the same team win the same championship five, six times in a row. Like, it just doesn't happen. Mm. Like, if you see a team win six, seven times in a row, it, it happens in Europe. And obviously there are some money discrepancies, you know, there's not a fair salary cap, there's all those things, but it's... I don't even know if it's always cheating. I think some refs are fans. You know, if you're a ref and you grew up, you know, supporting this team, are you psychologically, you know, making certain calls that you might not make because you're a fan of this team? Like, you know, everybody's human being, you know, and then some refs don't like players. If players are disrespectful, if they talk to them wrong, like you're human. Like if you're talking to me bad, part of me is not going to want to see you do well with the help of me. Like this is natural. So I think like, it goes both sides. It goes both ways. I think they try to do their best to judge the game, but you're human. It's impossible not to have some type of emotion when you're facing, you know, a game with this much intensity. But by the way, j just to make it clear, Union of EuroLeague basketball officials rejected accusations by providing their facts. Ukrainian Basketball Federation also supports uh, referee Rizik and actually provided some facts that could, let's say, say that uh, Ambrosov is corrupted. Uh, Rizik Karamilas also made their statements. So just to make it clear, these are just accusations. These are not yeah. facts, and it's not like it's it's proven for sure. Euroleague will start their own process, but yeah, this this whole situation, this whole story doesn't you know uh, doesn't look good uh, looking from a side. Yeah, I mean it's just unfortunate, you know. As a player, you just try to go into the game and just respect the game that you play, you know, for your team and. Um, I mean, I just go out there. Somebody like me, I mean, I'm out there putting everything on the line to see my team be successful and victorious. So um, you just want a fair game and you just want, you know, to go out there and things to be good. Um, like he said, I mean, the referees are human too. So you have to respect that even on, I mean, they have bad days. I mean, every, I mean, that's, you never know what someone's going through in their day. That's what I mean. So, um, but, I mean, as far as the situation, it's very unfortunate. I mean, I hope everything gets ironed out just for the game, you know, for the game to be safe, and a safe haven to go out there and just for the players to be able to go out there and play a fair game. And Because that's the last thing you want to be thinking about, you know, when you in a series or when you with someone and you out here hooping and you don't want to be thinking like, wow, like, we already got everybody against us. You know, we already on the road and everybody against us. We don't want this to be a part of the game too. You know, so you just want to go out there and you want to get a fair game and to just go out there and play hard and to do what you got to do to be successful, so. By the way, what are, from players' perspective, what are the signs or let's say symptoms that the game is being officiated differently? when things get weird. I mean, let's not uh, forget the fact of just making human mistakes, you know. We all do mistakes and sometimes it happens, you know, and occasionally. But when do you feel that something is going wrong? You know, something something is really different tonight about the officiating. For me, it's um, the body language. Um, just the environment too. Is the environment safe? Is it unsafe? Um, are these fans being controlled? When I know the fans are being controlled, everything's cool. The refs, you know, don't have that emotion as much, like, to feel for their safety, you know, fight or flight. When I feel like everything is under control, um, I feel like they're protected. I feel like the game is always going to be called appropriately. Um, but, you know, sometimes you do feel like 
some of the calls are swaying. Um, and it could be for you. It could be against you. You just never know. Or sometimes there's a vendetta. You know, you, you never know what's going on. But you can just feel when one side of the team is getting a lot of calls and you're not. Or when a team who shoots a lot of three-pointers is getting to the line a lot, you're not. Um, you know, these type of things. You don't know if they're necessarily just human mistake or you don't know if it's purposely. And that's the toughest part. And that's why regardless if it's the NBA, if it's yearly, whatever the case may be, like you're never going to truly know um, if someone's purposely doing something unless you can find a money trail. And that's the only way because other than that, it's just opinion. Yeah, I mean, in general, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, in, in general, I remember in college, I had uh, my college coach, he would have the referees like come explain us the rules, you know what I mean, like the specific rules. And it's like, okay, like, this is the rule. Like, this is what we going by. And, like, in the game, if I call this, it's because this is the rule, you know. Whether, like, you like it or not. Like, so, like, as players, like, you got to respect it. Like, okay, this is the rule. Like, this is the guideline. Like, this is what I need to do to be successful and to be able to go out here and use my abilities to be victorious, you know, and guarding guys and, on the offensive end and different things like that. So I feel like as a player, like when you have communication between the referees, you know, it's that's when the game is the best, when referees can, like, communicate, like, and explain things. Like, because at the end of the day, man, we in an environment, it's 20,000 people, something like that. Like, hey, emotions is high. I'm out here trying to win. I'm trying to – this guy trying to – shoot my face off. I'm trying to do what I got to do. I'm trying to handle my business and do what I got to do for my team. And so, like, emotions is high. It's different, like, if I'm just wilding out and just come, going at OD disrespecting you, you know, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, like, if I'm trying to talk to you and my emotions is high, don't take it the wrong way. I'm just trying to talk to you and trying to get to the bottom of a situation so I can be successful for my team and help my team in the best way possible. And so, the main thing is to just keep improving the communication between the players and referees so we can have the most fair game possible out there because at the end of the day, everybody's trying to go out there and play their best game for their team to be six, to be victorious. And refereeing is tough. It's one of the toughest jobs. I mean, they do an excellent job most of the time. It's impossible to be perfect, but it's a hard job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in general, like, I mean, just like, I mean, as players, everybody get a reputation, right? You know, and, you know, as a player, you might have a reputation with a referee. Like, you might see a guy or a woman and you're just like, damn, you know, let me just be my best version of myself. Let me go out here and let me try to handle my business because you just never know. And so that's why I'm just big on, like, the communication between both sides. And because at the end of the day, we all trying to go out here and put a good product on the floor to grow European basketball and, to be victorious. I'm trying to win for my team. The EuroLeague is trying to grow in general for itself as a uh, as an entity, as a product. And I'm a part of that by trying to go out here and win it for my team. So you just try to just go out there and be successful and to do the best that you can to um, be the best version of yourself. Whether it's a referee or a player, you know, I just want everybody to go out there and, the, you know, you're just trying to play a fair game and to do what you got to do and handle your business. So, Yeah, amen. Just just before heading to the end of the podcast, uh, I, I, re- I was really curious to hear uh, from your perspective one thing. I mean, last weekend in Athens, European basketball legend Nikos Gales got his Greek na- national team jersey retired by Greek Federation in Waka. Uh, we have also a great video about Nikos Ga- uh, Gallis ab- and his story on basketnews.com uh, YouTube channel. And I mean, he's, he's considered one of the European goats. And I was really, I mean, we all kind of have a clear picture who is the goat of basketball. Many of us uh, think that it's Michael Jordan. I don't know, maybe you have a different opinion on this uh, uh, regarding this question, but it's kind of clear. It's Michael Jordan or maybe somebody else. Maybe it's LeBron, maybe it's Kobe, maybe somebody brings uh, a different name, but the common answer is Jordan. I'm from Europe. I'm from Lithuania. And to be honest, I cannot name 
that one clear goat of European basketball, which might be even a problem from marketing wise, because you can build all those nice and crazy stories about Michael Jordan. You know, you can you can make money out of it. In Europe, we don't have it, and I think that's kind of our problem. And I was just really watching Nikos Galis being you know uh, respected in in front of thirteen thousand people in Greece. I was intrigued to hear what do you considered European basketball goat? Who is Michael Jordan figure? type of flair for you in Europe? For me, it's Dirk Nowinski. I mean, you're talking about a guy who not only dominated, you know, on the court with his performance, but he revolutionized the game. Just big man shooting the three-point shot, big man working from that mid-post area, showing the versatility, also being able to put it down on the on the deck a little bit, pushing tempo, leading a break. So for me, it was Dirk kind of expanding the horizon because when you're talking about greatness, you're not talking about just statistically. Obviously, that's a big factor. The stats he put up, the points, the rebounds. You're talking about his winning, his impact. But you're talking about how do you change the game? All the great ones changed the game. Michael Jordan changed the game. Steph Curry changed the game. LeBron James changed the game. Dirk Nowinski changed the game. So to me, it's clear. It's as simple as Dirk. Um, are there guys who are approaching him, applying, applying pressure? Of course. Giannis um, Anacupo, Nikola Jokic. These two are... are up in that stratosphere where they could possibly be on that type of level. But I just don't know if anyone will have the impact that Dirk had for me because that's who I grew up watching. That was the first person when European players weren't really getting the respect they needed in the league. And the the gap between the U.S. and the European national teams was so great. And I think, you know, his growth, his ascension, allowed other people to work on their games to improve, and it gave – Maybe young European players hope that Dirk's doing it. He's one of the best in the league. We can too. And that's when I think Europeans started to believe that you know, maybe they could win gold. Maybe they could, you know, be a star in the league. Maybe they could take it to another level. And, you know, credit Dirk for that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you said that because I'm from Dallas. I'm from East Dallas. So I grew up watching Dirk every day, literally. Like, I kind of, uh, like, he's an icon in Dallas. I mean, we have a statue literally downtown. I drive past it every other day. So uh, that's definitely the European GOAT. I mean, it's – I mean, him winning that championship kind of really stamped that, you know. But like you said, like the things he was able to do, I mean, it's funny when you think about, like, the revolution of the European player in the today's NBA game, you know, when you look at – somebody like Drazen Petrovic and then you look at like a Divac coming in the league, like the stigma around like a European player and the opportunities that they got in the NBA was so different then, you know. And then, I mean, somebody I grew up watching like a Stojakovic or, you know, like on the Kings or like – and then when you get to people like Dirk, you know, and you get to these other – Lithuanian guys and like it's just very interesting to see how that all that has progressed and when I look at that and when I look around that early time around the early 2000s you know Dirk definitely solidified I mean as far as the longevity and what he was able to do as far as representing his national team and coming in and putting that work in every night and looking NBA guys in the face you know and like I'm gonna do this fade away and can't none of y'all guard it. I don't care. You know, like, I'm about to just play my game. And so um, you look at him and you see that. And, I mean, I'm born in the 90s, so you can see how somebody like a Giannis or like a Jokic would see, like, success from that and be able to kind of have that pattern, that model to follow because both of them are cornerstones of their franchise. They've been in their franchise for, you know, years a decade plus years you know putting in work for a long time and that's what Dirk did you know he came to Dallas and he stayed in Dallas and he is Dallas you know you see it every day when you drive down past downtown and this and that I mean he always gonna be that iconic legend in the city you know and in the state of Texas so it's really really big for our city so Dirk is like like the end all be all when it comes to like European guys and as far as like 
taking that platform of the game to the next level for them and being able to expand the opportunities of guys coming in the NBA and not getting that stigma right away, you know, cause he had to work through that. I mean, I remember me being, when I was young, like, I mean, people was looking at Dirk, like he was soft, but he wasn't soft. His game was just different. He stayed to that. And he was able to grow through that, you know, with his habits and his patterns and different things like that. And, he grew to be on the top of the NBA, winning that championship, you know, beating LeBron in the big three. That was just a huge step. You know, I remember when he got to the first finals and played against D-Wade and Shaq, that was like a big step. Like, it was like, man, is Dirk going to do it? This is going to be crazy. And then it ended up happening in a harder platform to beat the big three, you know. So, I mean, he is like the the standard when it comes to European players. Obviously now Giannis and Jokic and, the guys coming in now are taking things to another level, you know, winning M- MVPs and championships. And when they name is – when they done and when they retire, they're going to be on a whole other platform. But when I think of the top standard, Dirk is the first name that comes up for me. Just because I grew up in Dallas and I've seen him – I've seen that up close every day, you know, whether I was in the – Nose, well, nose bleeding seats at the top of American Airlines Arena, the $50 seats – or whatever. If it was he was showing up to an outdoor tournament in the hood, playing against people, you know, showing up for events. I was going to stuff like that, and I seen his impact on the community and overall as a person and a player. So that's probably like the standard for me when it comes to that. So it's funny that you say that, E. And to my Lithuanian people, I know Sabonis had the most decorated European career, but what you have to understand is us Americans only saw Dirk in his prime when Sabonis mm-hmm. came to the lead. I'm old enough to have sure. seen him, but he was towards the end. He had some injuries. He still showed flashes, but we didn't get to see prime Arita Sabonis. We saw um, one who was more worn out, who had some injuries in those Blazers years. So if you look at just domination in Europe, oh, Sabonis. But if you go for most Americans, it's going to be Dirk because a lot of them have seen him in his prime. So no disrespect to the legend. Sabonis is an animal. His son is also a yeah. great player. Sabonis was putting <laughs> in work on me. I remember them Jailblazers teams. I mean, he was getting that ball at that at that post. He was pick, he was he was picking people apart. I mean, he was putting in work. Them Jailblazers teams was tough. I mean, I remember that. Yeah. It was coming up. You know, he was getting that. He was doing what he had to do. He had to ha- handle his business. And it's Funny to see his sons being successful in the same uh, field. So, respect to them as well. Guys, you don't need to explain to Lithuanian fans. <laughs> you should rather explain to Serbian fans for not choosing Jokic or for Greek fans not choosing Yanis or maybe even Nikos Galis, who is well respected here in, in Europe as well. So, Lithuanians, they're, they're okay. They are kind of, you know, got used to it. So, so you, you should better watch out for Greek and Serbian fans right now. Nah, I mean there's a there's a lot of Greek there's a lot of great Greek players. I mean you could go down the line when it goes to that. I mean I haven't really seen Gallus like that, you know. But I mean when you think of Spinuas, Papa Lucas, you know, Princesses, like you could just go down the line when it goes to the Greek legacy, and then Serbia has a long, long you know tradition. That's why I said like Stojakovic. Divac, you know, like when you think about guys like that, that's just the beginning, you know. And then when I got to Serbia, I learned a whole different list of players that I didn't even really think, you know, like Sasha Obradovic, like, well, uh, not the guy that was at Bologna that was coaching against us. Um, he was coaching the Bologna, the head coach of Bologna. I mean, he was a hell of a player as well, you know, like when you think about all the, all the different names, you know, like Sasa in the Diorovic. pedigree. Georgievich. Yeah. Yeah. Georgievich. Georgievich. Yeah. Georgievich. I, I mix them up. Both of them and Sasha. I mix them up. Yeah. But Georgievich, oh, I mean, we think was about a good him. Scorer too. was exactly. a good scorer too. <laughs> exactly. Both of those guys, you know. And so even like our GM, like Savage, you know, like was a good player with in his right, you know. You think about like, you go down the line, you know, of these countries and the pedigrees of the players that they have. I mean, it's a long, long history and lists, you know, of guys that didn't even play in the NBA, you know, that have that pedigree and that are looked at, you know, and then when you think about some that have made it to that highest level, that's a whole different entity. But as far as not bringing up Jokic and Giannis and stuff like that, they still got so many accolades and things to 
check off their list, man. They're going to be done. When they get done, it's going to be a whole different conversation. You know, those are first ballot Hall of Famers. So, I mean, kudos to them and all the work they putting in and coming over here and putting in work because I know that's not easy to come across that water and to adjust to new culture. And like I said, guys, is coming at you. Pit Bulls is coming at you every night. And so uh, respect to them for them coming over there to build habits and to put in work to be successful. Zach, speaking about Dirk, and so, as somebody who watched Dirk from 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 young days, probably he was not the guy who you try to follow, uh, trying to you know build your mid range jumper or like that strange weird technique. Uh, you're shooting the ball around the rim, right? It, it was somebody else you were le learning from. Nah, I mean it's funny because uh, I mean Dirk had that that one leg shot. So I would try to, like, do it. I mean, they would put it in workouts and stuff like that. I mean, when I was a kid, I was playing football. I was on the football field. I ain't really take basketball serious till maybe, like, I was 15, you know, sophomore year of high school. That was when I really was like, all right, I'm getting these growing pains in my back and in my knees. Man, let me get on this basketball court. It's hot out here in Texas. It's 110 degrees out here. Let me see what this basketball is talking about, you know. So, uh It was kind of different. It was a different dialect, you know, and so my game developed differently because I was a football player playing basketball. So, like, the main thing was that it was efficient and that it worked and that it worked at a high percentage. So coaches that I had in the neighborhoods that I grew up in, they were just like, hey, man, it's working. You putting the ball in the basket, like, hey, keep it going. Perfect it in whatever way you got. You know, the main thing is that you putting the ball in the basket at a high clip at a high efficiency and not turn the ball over you, not making dumb plays. So just keep on doing it and do it at a high level. And that's how I was taught. And all the coaches that I had ahead of that just respected it, respected that that was my shot, that that's how I played and that I have a funky game. It's not normal. Like, like certain guys have, like, you see guys like you like, Oh, this is what he does. Like you've seen, you can see guys and compare their games to, other people with mine is you can't really compare it i mean i'm i mean i have an older generation that uh i've been told this i'm compared to like i think this guy's name is george mcginnis with that shot you know you would have to look like and i had to look this up he was playing with like dr j something like that i mean he was <laughs> you know what i mean like and i'm like dang like and when i looked it up i'm like yeah he built like me he's built strong and he had big hands like me And so, like, and he did the same shot. So it's interesting that that shot came, you know, can come through de decades and still be alive today in 2023. So, hey, it is what it is. Hey, gentlemen, it was a pleasure to have you on your show. It was a pleasure to, let's say, meet Zach more in person and to see his way of thinking about basketball, to see his way of uh, watching and reading the basketball. And of course, Eric McCollum, as always, in his top shape. Uh, thanks for joining me in. Thanks for teaching all of us, you know, different perspective uh, of European basketball. And yeah, see you soon.